Wow. They put me on the early bird side. Thanks for being here. Uh, good morning, and thanks for having me uh, speak as part of day two of the SAFE Summit 2024. Uh, my name is Jigar Shaw, and I'm the Director of the Loan Programs Office at the Department of Energy. At LPO, our mission is to provide debt financing to large-scale, high-impact, clean energy and supply chain projects that help energy technologies deploy at scale and advance America's economic future. Confronting the challenges around building a domestic critical material supply chain is what brings all of you here today. Over the next 15 minutes, I'd love to give you a peek into my corner of this space through the work at LPO. I'll start in the same place where so many energy stories start today, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and the Inflation Reduction Act. Through Bill and Ira, Congress tasked LPO with a clear mandate to help onshore and reshore future critical sectors in the United States. The pair of laws also brought to my office hundreds of billions of funded loan authority to meet this mandate and others set out for us in the legislation. Unsurprisingly, critical minerals projects have come out of the gate strong in seeking LPO loans. Since IRA passed in August of 2022, critical minerals processing, recycling, and manufacturing projects have accounted for roughly one out of every three LPO announcements. These conditional commitments and closed loan announcements run the gamut from hundreds of millions of dollars for projects from startups like Redwood Materials in Nevada, Sire Resources in Louisiana, and Lifecycle in New York State, to multi-billion dollar loans for manufacturing of batteries sponsored by well-established corporates, such as the $2.5 billion direct loan to LTM Cells, a joint venture between General Motors and LG, as well as our most recent conditional commitment announcement of up to $9.2 billion to Blue Oval SK, a JV between Ford and Korean EV Titan SK on. And they keep coming. For now, all I can say is keep an eye on LPO's channels for tomorrow for yet another exciting loan announcement in the critical minerals space. So we've made a lot of good progress to date and are optimistic we can close many of those conditional, conditionally committed loans soon. But we still have our work cut out for us in the years ahead. The two loan programs most relevant to minerals projects, the Advanced Technology Vehicle Manufacturing Program, and because of changes in the bipartisan infrastructure law, now the Title 17 Innovative Clean Energy Program, have combined probably about $120 billion worth of uncommitted loan authority left, albeit that is available across all eligible sectors. At this point, you're probably asking yourself what the federal government is doing in all this. But let me propose a question back. Have you ever tried to fund a commercial scale facility with 100% equity? It's expensive. And if you go to all the usual suspects of institutional investors, it is similarly unlikely they will extend debt to a project that deploys a technology they've never financed before in a sector with so much geopolitical risk. And so since it was first envisioned in the Energy Act of 2005, LPO has been tasked by Congress with solving this billion dollar chicken and egg problem across emerging decarbonization technologies. That isn't to say that we pick winners and losers. Whether a company or specific technology, they really pick themselves through their competence in surviving a one-year process of financial, technical, and legal review and diligence. And unlike a bank, we can do this successfully because we have the expertise to prove these technologies fundamentally work through thousands of scientists and experts and engineers at the DOE and the National Lab Platform. And so diligence is something we've long been adept at. And as I said before, large-scale, high-impact, clean energy supply chain projects are our bread and butter. LPO has been building muscle memory, diligencing these kinds of projects since the early 2010s, when we funded some of the first utility-scale solar and wind projects in the US, as well as the first EV manufacturing facilities with Tesla and Nissan. But it's not just muscle memory especially as we've moved to working in geopolitically significant industries like critical minerals. We've taken a look at our diligence process, scrutinized them, and brought them to where they need to be to meet today's moment. Because we can't just throw up our hands at any foreign involvement. In addition to other risks we assess, we have to take seriously our responsibility to protect federal investments from foreign risks and influence, 
But our mission is also at risk if we don't engage our international partners for three primary reasons. First, foreign direct investment in the United States is critical to the generational opportunity to rebuild our manufacturing base. Second, as a result of decades of manufacturing policy, certain clean energy construction manufacturing capabilities do not exist in the United States workforce. And last but not least, our statute, which welcomes structures involving foreign ownership so long as they are projects on U.S. soil. So what we do instead is adopt a whole-of-government approach commensurate to manage the risk of involved foreign entity poses. Not unlike a bank, just with a very deep bench of federal intelligence and expertise. First, we are clear that our borrower from the beginning must, before any disbursement of funds, they must meet certain conditions to mitigate risks we identify and across the life of the loan in order to protect taxpayer dollars. These mitigants can include diluting ownership by foreign entities of risk, development and implementation of a robust plan to protect IP, and to shift the sourcing materials from US to US and ally countries. Second, we consult State Department and the US International Development Finance Corporation on country supply chain risks for critical materials as part of standard diligence. DOE's Office of International Affairs further coordinates due diligence reviews and risk mitigation to ensure national security, economic competitiveness, and technology leadership are incorporated into loan activities. And finally, through our Portfolio Management Division, we closely monitor this project to ensure alignment with U.S. national security and economic competitiveness objectives. Our process is a prime example, managed risk versus long-term dependence on countries that may not have our best interest at heart. And I'll let you in on a little secret. In addition to improving the country, getting through our diligence will make projects far more likely to succeed. Our losses are roughly 3.1% across the entire portfolio, which is a very reasonable number compared to the risks that we're being asked to take. So as an aggregate, we've been extraordinarily good at making companies more disciplined. Once someone gets a conditional commitment from us, that means they're actually, they're actually forced to ask the hard questions and answer the hard questions, like whether the technology really works, that their offtake strategy is really up to snuff and if they are actually relevant to big buyers of critical materials. Once someone has a conditional commitment, they have separated themselves from the rest of the field by being able to answer all of those questions in a tight fashion. Most importantly, equity investors want folks who can get through our process. So if you're out there thinking about a project in this space, I hope I've convinced you in my short time today that LPO stands ready to be a resource for you. And if you're looking at investing in these kinds of projects, maybe giving you a hint on where to look. Or on the off chance that you're about to go legislate that at the very least, LPO is a key tool for America's global competitiveness, security, and prosperity. I'll leave you with this figure. Since October of 2021, LPO has advanced 10 projects representing more than $16.5 billion in conditional commitments uh, or closed loans for perspective, LPO has closed just five ATVM loans totaling $7.8 billion in its entire history before that. That alone underscores my belief that this is the precipice of the largest wealth creation opportunity of our lifetimes. As the critical mineral sector blossoms with new battery chemistries, new companies, new applications, the opportunities certainly aren't shrinking. Luckily, Congress planned for this in the Inflation Reduction Act, and we are working on guidance that expands eligibility for the ATVM program beyond, beyond light-duty vehicles given to us in the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law. Where IRA falls short, however, is allocating funds to administrate the ATVM program in a way that keeps up with expected activity through the next decade. With $22.71 billion in loans requested and growing, LPO expects to exhaust ATVM base funding prior to the expiration of the funded authority that makes an expanded ATVM program possible. After these remarks, I'll be making my way to the Hill to ask the House Appropriations Committee to accept our FY 2025 request, which allows us to continue outreach and origination activities to meet the growing interests of the private sector. With $7.1 billion in ATVM loans projected for fiscal year 24 and $11.7 billion for fiscal year 25, the need is real. 
And so, if you're an entrepreneur thinking about using ATVM in the next decade, feel free to call your representative and let them know that Jigger sent you. Just maybe wait until after, you know, Governor Cooper closes a couple more loans. In all seriousness, thank you so much to the SAFE team for having me open day two of your summit. And to all of you for being here. I hope to see many of you in LPO's inbox with big ideas in the years to come. Thanks, everybody.